Okay, everybody still taking a break? Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So now we're going to talk about sustainability in a way that benefits Oh. Hi. Hi. Hey, cool. Alfonso, that's cool. Undergraduate psychology, which is a kind of common professor or doctor, but graduate students think they're common, whatever they want. They do anyway. Okay. So, so right now, the next hour, we're going to talk about uh, sustainability and some of the benefits associated with, with uh, food systems. We're talking about food justice, food sovereignty. Okay. Talk about some of these different matters. So let's start with this uh, development, uh, justice, safety, and security. How is food associated with these qualities of our human experience? Well, as I sort of alluded to earlier, food activities are huge economic drivers and always have been. They also drive a lot of what differentiates us in terms of social status. So our social status often is determined by what we eat. So if I say caviar, right, that's expensive, right? It's a status. It marks, it determines, it indicates inequality between people. When I was a graduate student, I was raised in the middle of nowhere. You know, nothing. When I went to graduate school, I went to a, a fancy graduate school in the United States. And I had a, a nice fellowship to go there. They gave me a lot of money to go. And they had a big reception for the fellows. So when I walk into the reception, and there's this big trays of food, right? And there are six knives, six kinds of knives to cut cheese. I never seen that in my entire life. I had no idea how to use them. What did I do? I went to the bar and I got a beer. <laughs> I could do that, right? And I sat there and I drank the beer and I watched people eat so that I could learn how to use those tools. Justice, inequality, status, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, food sovereignty. So a long time ago, uh, with the Romans, right, olive oil from Spain was more popular than olive oil in Italy. Huge distribution networks emerged to move the oil from here to there. They made huge jars, clay jars. Those jars got old, they broke down, and they got thrown into piles. They became hills in Rome. They're hills. They're physical changes in the physical geography from moving food. That's interesting, right? So that, that just has everything to do with economic development. Always been an economic driver. The international spice trade, I don't even have to tell you that. You guys learned all that when you were in high school. Intra-European trade. That's what I was talking about earlier today. The notion that uh, if we want to do trade between kingdoms in Europe in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, there were no laws governing that trade. In fact, what people did was kill each other, right, to maintain the boundaries. So if you wanted to trade, you had to have laws. You had to be governed by extra territorial regulations. So all of those things contributed to changing status, right? Because if only the kings could get something, then that made very high status. Slowly though, inequalities get eroded as people learn how to manipulate the system or change the system to make it work for them. Okay. So what, what I want you to just continue to think about is not just what you can see in terms of what we're eating, right? Or at the grocery store or whatever it happens to be, but how there's simultaneously changes in the legal, and social, and organizations that are going on in order to produce different ways of eating, right? Different, different ways of consumption. Because if you think about it, a hundred years ago, many years ago it was different. There's a lot of laws, a lot of changes to give us the system we have today. A hundred years from now, the system's going to look different. 
whether we like it or not, it's going to look different for various environmental and ecological challenges that we face. The system is going to change. So we have to try and be conscious about what we want it to look like and try and develop some, some uh, ways to deal with it. So the historical economic uses that were very important to cosmopolitanism, to bringing people together, to eroding social boundaries, those uses continue, right? Don't you love going and learning about somebody else's food, right? Going to a party at some other ethnic restaurant that you're not familiar with? Those make us richer people. They enrich us as human beings. Right? They help us understand each other through various the analogies that we have and other sorts of things. But at the same time, the big system has imposed certain demands on us, like food safety. And that I pointed out very well. Nothing gets me more angry than somebody putting my child in danger. And 2,500 kids were in danger from a poor food safety situation. That's a lot of angry parents. Angry, angry, angry. And the grandparents are probably not happy about it either. <laughs> right? So food safety demands of contemporary society impose new regulatory restrictions. In some places, more than others. In some places, less than others. Some activities, there'll be higher restrictions than in other activities. Like, for instance, farmers markets, the market we visit tomorrow, the produce probably isn't all washed, right? Like you get at the grocery store. But there's probably not a lot, and who cares? We're smart. They get home and wash them, right? It's not rocket science. It's not a. But there are other circumstances where food safety is very important. With improved food safety, Transportation over greater distances becomes more possible. Storage over longer times becomes more possible. So you see how these things work together. You change one part of the system, another part changes. So with, with transportation, likewise, as transportation technology improves, the food system changes. So in the United States, in the late 19th century, the, the canals, uh, to change the waterways between the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean enabled the transportation of lots of food, which enabled the growth of big cities. Right? So, so transportation, technological changes there can change, can change things. Uh, so again, transportation technology, talking about organizational change. If you've got to, if you have the chance to make a lot of money, by moving a lot of food from one place to someplace else, then you create an organization to do it. The word for that organization is bureaucracy. Right? Bureaucracies were invented not just to make war, but to move large quantities of products from place to place. Bureaucracies were invented not just for the state to exist, but also organizationally to enable people to do things in very standardized ways to make a lot of money. Does this make sense? Yeah? So, what I'm suggesting here is that if we're going to change the system from one with large organizations dominating the system, we're going to have to have organizational forms that are responsive to a smaller and more flexible system. They may not all look like the big bureaucracies that we are used to. If I take you and plunk you down, in a, if I put you someplace, until you get, get along in this place, you can do it because you know how to stand in line in the bureaucracy, stand in the line and go and fill out the form, right? But that organizational form may not be the best suited to the variety of food activities that we're talking about. Food research. Does everybody here know the word regression analysis, that term? Statistical technique? to fit a curve on a data point, right? You've got a normal distribution, you've got lots of points on the curve, you fit the line of least squares, squares, you know what I'm talking about? You know where that technique came from? Corn production. In the 1920s, that's a normal distribution. For social life, normal distribution is a bad idea. 
right? Just, I, I could talk for two days just about why that's a bad idea. But for corn, it's a good idea, right? You can study any, the, the produce of any plant and plot it on a normal distribution and fit it to a curve and look at the independent variables and understand what accounts for changes in the productivity of that land. Oh, yes? So, food research and hybridization and genetically modified organisms have enormously increased the productivity of the land and enormously allowed transportation. Apples, right? We have not very good tasting apples because the ones that we have have been bred to travel on, right? So, science, so our contemporary situation, right? has a, many components to it. The demand for food safety, the transportation that that allows, the food research. People like Odd and I have get paid to do research, right? In the sciences, that's what we get paid to do, right? To do research on, on, on food. So, as, as, as food research has improved the ability to move uh, product around the world, we get very efficient. And you get efficient, your costs decrease, your profits increase. Everybody's happy, right? No. Right? Because why aren't they happy? Because it doesn't taste good, it's not as nutritious, you know? There's certain aspects of it that people like, and other aspects of it that people have come to realize they don't like. So even though there was there's efficiency in the system and the prices have decreased. Still, under this big economic crisis that we're currently in, there's people who are suffering more. Right? There, you know, and that economic crisis has, has increased problems with what people call food security. Do you have enough food to eat? Right? And, and food sovereignty. Right? The ethnic, the respect for people of, of color, of different ethnic groups, has brought up the idea of food sovereignty. My food's okay. The way I grow it is okay. I have a right to grow it my way. I own my food. And the corporation can't have my food, can't patent my particular kind of corn or my tomato or my chili or my squash or, or you know, whatever the local products are here that Andres talked about that are unique to this area. Right? Terror, right? How do you say that word in French? You know, the Provence. Terroir, la tierra? Yeah, terroir, you know, it's the word that indicates the land that... The, it's more than that. Land, land, but it, it's associated with the organization, but mm -hmm. in a short, short form version, the, the particular of a place, yeah, the, the, the origins of a particular food of a place uh, are central, are one very important, even central, to this question of food sovereignty. Who controls the food, right? And who and for what purposes will they put it to? Okay. Do you know who Muhammad Bouazizi was? No? He was the Tunisian fruit vendor who burned himself to death two springs ago that ignited the Arab Spring. He was a street vendor and he sold food, he sold produce. People don't think that food can't change the world. That guy changed the world. He changed a lot of people's view of the world. And it's important, I think, for us to think, in terms of food justice, about what it is people are struggling for, and why some people have no idea about it. Some people have no idea, and that's okay. You know, I'm not here blaming people. Oh, you don't know about food justice, you're a bad person. No, 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 no. It's not about that at all. What it's about is acknowledging and recognizing that people have different uh, perspectives on this. And that we need to find ways to, to reconcile, to bring those together in some way, to reconcile those perspectives, so we can advance our different, our different causes. There's a couple of things I want to say about this. Food injustice, food injustice is a slow poison to our societies. <clears throat> Where there's injustice, especially around food, it is a poison. Not only physically do 
you people who are malnourished don't get the same opportunities to think like you and I, right? But then go around hungry and tired and they don't enjoy the same quality of life. But that same injustice affects the rest of society in many ways because those people eventually can't participate to the same capacity everybody else can. So food, food injustice is a, is, a, is a serious problem. The empirical example I'll give you is some work that I wrote uh, a year ago or two about grocery stores. In the United States in the 1960s, there were grocery stores everywhere, pretty evenly distributed, okay, per capita. But in the late 60s and 1970s, grocery stores started leaving particular neighborhoods. Whose neighborhoods did they leave? Poor people, black people, brown people. The grocery stores left. Why did they leave? They were afraid of things like the riots in Los Angeles in, 19, in 1968. They were afraid of higher costs associated with those riots, higher insurance, right? having to pay employees more right? to work in those neighborhoods. And so they left those neighborhoods, and then lenders would say, we won't loan money to you if you want to put a grocery store in this neighborhood because this is a dangerous neighborhood. Okay? In effect, we had something called grocery store redlining, where lenders would draw a line around a place and say, no money here. Right? That's, some, that's bad. Because right? it limits people's access to you know, healthy food. It limits people's ability to get what they want. Now, so, and then what's, what, what compounds that Think about what happens then. Here you are, person in the inner city, right? And you go to the grocery store and you buy food and you go home and you prepare it and you cook it. And then one day the grocery store closes and leaves. Your teenage kid isn't going to have a job. You don't have a place to buy food to prepare it. So you start buying food at the corner store already prepared, right? So you don't teach your children how to cook. So your children grow up, they don't know how to cook. What's food for them, right? They, food is what you buy at the restaurant, right? Or the corner store already, you know, something already prepared, like at our lunch line today, you know? The store at the lunch line, just walk through the line, get some food, pay a few bucks for it, because it's the prices are decreasing because everybody's more efficient, right? So it's, it's relatively speaking, more affordable. But, you're losing all those skills, all that knowledge, those relationships. You see what I mean? And that's, when you stretch out the time horizon and you see how things are connected together, you see where these problems come from. I hope it doesn't happen in Europe. Because this has happened in the U.S. already. So many people don't know how to cook. They don't know how to cook. Millions and millions and millions of people don't know how to cook. So, food justice, the implications of it ramify, they connect throughout society. That's what, that's what I'm seeing. Now let's think about food security for a moment, okay? And I know we all just ate, so we want to do food digestion. Right? We all want to take a nap to digest our food. But, no, it's time to work. Alright. So, food security. Digest this. Okay? Read this and think about this one. Okay? to compare it. So take a look at it, find things that you think are interesting.
you know, look at, you know, that's the WHO, right? The World Health Organization. Now here's the United States Department of Agriculture. Sorry, I mistyped that. I apologize. At all times, enough food that two shouldn't be there. I'm sorry. I think there should be a dash there. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let me say to you, yes, in the United States, people have to steal to have food. People have to sell their bodies to have food. Responsibility. So look at the USDA's 
In the United States, this is how food security and insecurity are measured. Right? This is how they're measured. Now, six years ago, they were measured this, these categories, high food security, that's a person like us, by and large, probably, and certainly me, right? Marginal food security. If you want to see the actual definitions, they're in the slides that you can look at, okay? Marginal is probably more like you, right? Graduates can't always get what you want all the time, but you're not going hungry usually, right? Low food security, that's like the poorest people, poor people. Very low food security, that's people who miss meals regularly. So that would be if, if in order to feed my kids, in you know, RU7, or my, my kids, I go without eating once or twice a day to make sure that you only have to go without food maybe once a day. You know, so I go twice without, and you guys go once without. You see what I mean? That's very low. And they started this range in 2006 because so many people were missing meals in order for the household to have, so that other people in the household could have food. Crazy, huh? So, security. So let's, let's see. Okay, I want to stop right there for a moment, and I want to ask you all to think, especially the, the, uh, the Spanish folks here, or people who know about the, about the local food system, how would we measure? Would food security be an important thing? And if not, why not? If so, how would you understand it? How would you measure it? Does anybody have any idea? Is it important? Is food security important? It is? Yeah. How would you measure it? Is there data gathered on it? I don't know. These are important things, you know. I don't know the answers to these questions myself. I wanted to stop though for a second and, and try and see what you all thought about that. Okay. That's okay that you don't know. But it is something, you know, it doesn't matter, right? It is something to think about though. Because different elements of society have different access to food. Okay? So, security. Let's say we have food security. Let's say that we have food justice. Do we still need food sovereignty? That is, self-determination of food? That is to say, if I'm an Indian tribal person, do I have say about my food supply, about what I'm growing? Do I have control over my genetic inheritance of, of my tribe, the food of my tribe? That's food sovereignty, okay? So let's look at food sovereignty. I know food sovereignty may not be the most relevant thing to this project, but let me share it with you anyways. Food sovereignty is these things. Let me just give you, let you look at it, and then I'll tell you why it's relevant, okay? So, in the Americas, from Canada to Tierra del Fuego, there's a lot of groups who are making this argument. They are demanding the right to define their own system and the right to distance themselves from the global supply chains, from the global food system. That may not be important in this particular instance, but as a source of information for how to argue about something, it is interesting. As a comparison to what other people are doing, it may have its uses. This is, well, this is why I wanted to share with you. 
Let me, let me share with you a couple of examples. The International Peasants Union, they have these seven principles. That it's a human right, that there should be agrarian reform. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, changing the parcels here and aggregating parcels, right? It just means use, perhaps, of the land itself, right? Fair trade in corporate domination, right? This is very normative, very normative. Social justice, in harmony with nature. Here's a good example of it. I wrote about these guys in a, another book chapter. This is uh, an, Indian, an Indian tribe in the U.S. And their, their whole idea is to use the food not just for self-sufficiency, but to turn their food practices into economic and community development. To turn their food activities into an opportunity to improve their own, their quality of life, their lifestyle. And so they have cultural programs that reunite their kids to the food ways and food myths and food knowledge, right? And educational programs, nutrition and uh, economic development and other sorts of programs. So that's sort of the, the idea of, 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 of food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is fundamentally about power. Who has power and what are they using that power to do? Who sets the agenda? Agenda setting power. Alternative organizational forms, not just the same organizations that do things, but changing the structure of organizations in order to get things done. <coughs> Adopting different organizational forms. Um, so, food sovereignty is the flip side of food injustice. Food injustice is not having the power to feed your family, to feed yourself. Food sovereignty is seeking ways to uh, access and apply that power. Okay. So, let me ask you, are justice, sovereignty, and security related? How are these things related in your minds? How are they related? If they're not related, fine. I'm cool with that. Tell me no and tell me why not. I will take one response. Don't worry. I'm not going to pressure you here. Some of you be brave and speak up. When they are related, since um, if you don't have food sovereignty, you are exposed to market forces that are alien to you, so uh, you can't get food enough. There you go. And market forces that are alien to you, okay, let's focus on that. Because that's what we're going to move to. How do local food systems relate to global markets, right? Right now, you guys know, and for the last hundred years, most food has traveled about 1,500 miles. For, if we know this, not just from research in the last 10 or 15 years, but from an analysis done in this book that I shared with you guys, uh, the, the table of contents, the How Great Cities Are Fed book, from 1934, 19, whatever it is. They actually discuss in that book, they do an analysis of how many miles it takes uh, food to travel from its point of origin to New York City. That was their point of comparison, New York City. And in the 1920s, it was 1,500 miles, which is about what it is today. So how do local food systems relate to global markets? Well, let me give you another graphical representation of this. Everybody, everybody get out a pencil. Got something to write on, okay? Let's start with this two circles. This interior circle is a zero. What we're creating here is tiers of the food system. Okay, tiers of the food system. There's going to be four of them. Okay, in the zero tier, the most central aspect of food is self-production. What you garden yourself, you can yourself, you cook yourself, you eat yourself. Right? That's the basic closest tier of food system activities. We're going to see. You've seen around town, we're going to see tomorrow, or the next day in the gardens, people who are practicing this 
system, this part of the system. You know people who garden, they're in that, they're operating in that area. One, tier one, this is direct marketing. This is the farmer selling directly to the consumer. The consumer knows where the food's coming from, the farmer gets the most for their money. For their effort is compensated the highest. Right? Okay? Tier two. If this is, if tier zero is self-production, tier one is direct marketing, what do you think tier two is? What do you think, what kind of supply chains, what kind of organizational activities do you think are happening in tier two? Only trade. Only trade. There's, there's definitely two, definitely starts in, in, uh, introducing the combination, right, of very local small trade and larger scale. Larger scale trade that will be in tier three, right? So here in tier two, we get what's called intermediated supply chains. We get people who, who are growing more food than they can eat, and more food than all their neighbors can eat. They're growing enough food to actually make some money, but they, don't, they wouldn't know what to do with it if they didn't have a distribution system to connect to. So they have to have a larger distribution system to move that food. People are very good at growing food. You grow enormous amounts of food if you want to. And so if you don't want it to go to waste, you have to put it, you need to move it someplace. So tier two, right here, tier two, this is where the supply chains, this connects local and larger supply chains. Now, down here, are we very efficient? No, we may, we may not be very efficient. You know, we, we may be driving diesel trucks around and emitting a lot of greenhouse gases, and we may not be efficient with our time. Okay? But tier three, what do you think tier three is? If this is connecting local and regional, local to larger, then what do you think tier three is? Yeah, we're getting worldwide, right? Tier three and tier four, four is totally global, right? Very efficient, huge trucks, huge tanker boats crossing oceans, right? It's more efficient to move to ship bananas from South America to the United States than it is to grow them in South Florida, where they grow, right? So, tier, tier three is, again, efficiency, but more on a national scale. Tier four is like global scale. So, when, so, across these things, we have different organizational forms. Here in zero and one, there's families. Most of the vendors you'll meet tomorrow at the market, they're families, right? Maybe they are gonna operate in different ways, but they're small-scale producers. That's my guess, anyways, I actually don't know that. But that, that's my guess. And they have no connection to these larger tiers, right? And likewise, these folks here, they don't have any real presence here except through the grocery store. Right? They, they don't have, so in here, there's, some, there's opportunities where the two can meet. We'll see. I don't know. But, so, when there's a lot of food produced, and there is, right, it's got to get distributed, it's got to get processed, and that processing and distribution can, can, can go a little ways, or maybe it grow, goes a long ways. And one question is, is, what are the rules or the laws that exist that help it move across the system? Another little example. In Wisconsin, you are allowed to sell $10,000 worth of food that you grow in your house without any permits or licenses. So food I grow, I could sell it if I wanted to, up to $10,000 without any health permits or any business licenses or anything. And you say, well, how do you know what $10,000 is? <laughs> I don't know. That's the law, though. In Illinois, they copied that law and they made it $25,000. So that's a way for, for these people that operate at this very low scale can, to kind of penetrate out here a little bit to 
in the local region and make some money doing it. They can process their own food and move it that way. A lot of these small farmers, one of the, one of the good things about local food is the story. It's when you can tell a story. Yeah, I got this from my farmer. How many of you earlier today said, yeah, you know, kind of have the basics of a story if you're talking about your food experiences? Well, farmers know that. They know that if they can get you hooked into their story, they'll have a customer. And so it's very important to use that they use technologies to transmit that story. And you know how they do it? With QR codes, right? With these little. These little, uh, these little things, right? Scan it, takes you to a web page, tells you the story of the food. In, in a research project that I'm doing with farmers in Wisconsin, we're encouraging them to use this because people your age do that. You will scan this and you will look at it and you will learn stuff from it. And you'll believe it. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you can believe it. It's true. Believe me. I'm the professor. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So there's lots of different ways that work in the food system can relate, right? To through through the local to the global, or the local to the regional. Different sorts of technologies, lots of different, lots of different practices. Clear? Okay. All right. So now let's think about sustainability. In terms of local food systems, there's lots of ways local food can make it for more sustainable places. One, stormwater management. In the United States, there's a lot of pavement. A lot of water falls on that pavement, it's got to get managed. Gardens, green spaces help manage stormwater. Composting, there's a lot of food waste. A lot of food waste. That food waste can get turned into the good soils. My compost pile in my own personal garden is about that big. Every year, I, I get lots of good soil out of my food waste. Coffee grounds, tea, banana peels, eggshells, everything, right? Composting. So composting. Composting, uh, en energy conservation and production of energy through composting. So you can use food waste to create energy through biodigestion, through various biophysical processes. Uh, but does local food lower energy consumption? The most important thing any farmer or any locality can do to conserve their resources is reduce their energy footprint. It's much easier to do that than to produce energy. So it's very important to look for ways in the local system to, to conserve energy, to reduce energy waste. How can we speak of economic or, or health benefits here? Well, one, we can connect gardeners to local businesses. There's lots, there's examples I heard you guys talking about. But then in the U.S., there's lots of examples of gardeners selling their produce to restaurants. Right? And uh, there's lots of uh, indications of the importance of green space to mental health. If you have a, a nice, comfortable, pretty place to live, then you're saying, oh, wow, you know, uh, this is really, you know, fun, fun to live in. There's lots of educational initiatives in the U.S. They use gardening. So the kids garden and they learn about measurement and <coughs> biology and all kinds of stuff that, that uh, and farm to school programs where local farmers grow food that gets sold to food districts, processed in those districts, and then the kids eat it at lunch. Right? Nutritious, beautiful food. So, uh, uh, one of my students is working on a farm to school project. I have her PowerPoint slides here that I'd be happy to share with you. They're really, really very cool. Um, however, even though we've got a lot of sustainability going on, we've got this uh, climate change problem. Now, climate change has at least two sides to it, right? One of them is how is our growing our production process, or, one of them is how our production practices respond or adapt to climate change. So if it's getting warmer, how do we adapt to that climate change? And how do we adapt in cold climates to uh, the needs for continued food production, right? So there are a lot of season extension technologies like greenhouses, 
right? Extend the 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 the, uh, the 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 season. And then there's lots of other things like aeroponics and aquaponics and hydroponics that take hot climates and make them more adaptable to food production. So aeroponics is having a room like this infused with steamy, nutritious water and let the roots hang down. Hydroponics is water, right, that grows the... And aquaponics is fish farming, right? vertical farms, and I mean, yeah, I, 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 you, know, you can go, there's a lot of these things. Some of them are viable. Some of them are attracting investment, right? Because investors know, you know, that change is coming. So you can look at some, we don't know what's going to happen. That's the bottom line. There's some basic stuff uh, in the U.S. and in the FAO uh, and in the EU, I believe. There's uh, research that people are starting to assemble on, on climate change and climate adaptation strategies. Land tenure. Now, what do I mean by land tenure? Who owns what? Right? Who owns what? Let's say, let's say that I'm a peach tree. I'm a peach tree. Oh, and, and this is my land, I'm a tree, right? And this is public land. And here's a peach. And you're walking along, oh, peach, I'm going to eat it. Is it my peach or is it his? There's a tenure question for you, huh? <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the U.S., that's actually an interesting problem. <laughs> Kind of, that's, that shows you how stupid we are. <laughs> you have to pick it earlier. Huh? You have to pick the, the fruit earlier. Earlier, well. And there is an organization called Fallen Fruit <laughs> that is around the world now, started in Los Angeles, that shows you where you can go get fresh fruit in your area for free, just you know, picking it out of public places or semi-public places. Right, where there's ambiguous. So when we talk about land tenure, I'm, I'm coming at it from a very different perspective for the moment. Okay, I'm trying to show you the implications of the way that food is grown, what implications it has for access to that food. Now, there aren't necessarily consequences for who owns what, but there are consequences for eating something, for you know having a full stomach, right? For half the food that you might not otherwise be able to get to. Another is guerrilla gardening. Right? Those people are crazy. <laughs> they, they, they set up gardens in public parks, in out of the way places, in those gardens, and they do it self consciously, either against the law or avoiding the law. Right? They're guerrilla gardeners. So that's, these are one, this is one side of the, of the land tenure issue. And my point here, people, is actually goes back to an old dead German named Karl Marx. Okay? Because what this is about, right? What this is about fundamentally is exchange versus use value. Right? So if, if I'm finding food or grill or grill gardening, I'm doing it because I want to use it. I'm doing it for leisure, I'm doing it for my own self. I'm not doing it to exchange it with you for something else. You know, I grow a lot of food at home. I give it away. I grow asparagus. You should see my asparagus. You know, garlic, oh my God, onion, chili. And I give it to people. And people, you might say, oh, but you're going to get something back. Well, maybe, but that's not why I'm doing it. I do it because I enjoy it. Right? So, but there is a distinction between doing something because you're going to be able to exchange it and doing something for its own inherent sort of purpose. And that's what Marx pointed out to us in the first volume of Capital. God, I hated that book. <laughs> in any case, it had some good points, but reading that is impossible. All right, now let's look at the, the, the other side of the land tank, okay? Now, there's a lot of different tenure strategies that a person can pursue. In my slides, there's a pretty lengthy discussion in the notes, 
Okay? Pretty lengthy discussion. Let me just summarize it by saying that there's lots of strategies and policies that can be adopted by different jurisdictions. So, for instance, you can do simple use agreements, which is what it sounds like in Spain you can do. Very simple use agreements, even post hoc, right? Even after the fact, if I'm gardening here for five years, and then the owner shows up and says, what are you doing? Gardening? Oh, can I have some? Sure, dude, go. You know, now get off my lap. Okay, bye. You know, I mean, at least there's an opportunity for use. There, there's use agreements. But there's also other sorts of legal, uh, uh, legal devices, legal tools, like fee simple payments, rents, uh, or land trusts. In the United States, there's something called community land trusts, where what people are doing is putting land close to the urban area, productive land, into a trust in perpetuity, you know, forever, that nothing can be done except to grow food. That allows the, the farmer access to quality land close to the market, which reduces costs, and, but it reduces other things. It reduces great greenhouse gas emissions, right? It, you know, there's, it enhances access. There's other, there's other, uh, <coughs> other things as well. Now, in this regard, I have another little project for identifying suitable land. Because what makes a suitable land? Oh, oh, you know, well, you know, you've got to have, you've got to be close. The, water, the land can't have uh, heavy metals, right? It cannot have bad chemicals. It's got to be close to water, right? It's got to be close, it's got to have some security. You know, contingent on that place has to have some security. Uh, it's got to have uh, access to the farmer. The grower's got to be close to it so that the grower will go to it, right? So you have all these different dimensions. I had a student do his master's on this last year. And he went through the entire city of Madison and found every parcel that could be farmed, public or private. And now what we're doing is we're and he ground tested that, he ground truth it. He went to everyone. And now what we're doing is we're taking those, uh, uh, those ground truth data and overlining it with LIDAR images. You know, uh, 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 aerial photos that, that, that are ground penetrating radar, not penetrating, but ground, that are radar images that allow you to see the, the tree cover, the shading. So, so that, a person doesn't have to walk everywhere to see what's possible, but then you just fly a plane over it and you can see, and then overlay that with zoning or other sorts of land use maps, and you can see where, where land, where productive land is. I'm sorry, that wasn't a very good explanation. But do you kind of get it, what I'm saying? In other words, we want to substitute human work, when possible, for technological uh, ways to identify uh, land for productive for, for productive pr purposes. Okay. So, hmm, where does that leave us? Well, I don't know, but I'm at the end of this lecture, and so what I need to, to share with you is what I need to ask you is. If you think, if you have any questions, let me just ask you if you have any questions. The purpose, let me kind of summarize what I hope that you got out of this. One, that economic development, food justice, food sovereignty, food access concerns, those things are not necessarily together all the time, they're not necessarily separate all the time. They can be put together and used for different purposes, okay? And then climate change, that's going to happen, right? So I just want you to be able to think about that. And I also want you to think about um, the, the sort of sustainability questions in terms of how it is we, we measure food security and, how, and what we can do with it in terms of planning for enhanced food security. How do we plan for better, for more enhanced food security? What tools have we got? Okay? That's what I'm hoping that you got out of this. But you can always look at the slides. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any comments? Because I feel like I wasn't quite as clear on a couple of these points as I probably could have been. I'm 
I'm sorry. Okay. Let me. I should have said earlier. If I'm saying something too fast, tell some tell folks here so that I can maybe try and slow down a little bit. Or if I'm not clear, tell me. All right. Tell somebody. Tell me. Tell me. I, I can take it. Okay. All right. So tell me if I do something better. Okay. So what I what this tells me it's now five o'clock. Uh, let's take about a seven minute break. Right. That's what we got. Right. Huh? And because this is next, local food systems and private sector. Okay? Let's take a break.